a couple of my uh, my colleagues. Uh, so Tracy Ingle, uh, the uh, in the historic environment team, uh, and uh, who's also contributed to the island plan review process, is also uh, on the call today. As is um, Natasha Day. So uh, Tracy will be um, responding to any queries in the in the chat as we run through the the presentation, and uh, will also be available to to answer any any questions. Um, in terms of the um, the material that we'll be covering today, um, I'll be touching uh, a little bit on the um, consultation process, just where we are with the um, uh, the timeline for the preparation of the plan. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of the the draft plan itself before we then uh, dive into the um, the key substance of the presentation today, which is around the historic environment. Uh, we'll look at the strategic policies and the evidence base that's of relevance to that. Uh, and then we'll look at the, the detailed thematic policies that cover this this issue. Uh, and then lastly, we'll just give you a bit more information about how you can continue to engage in the process. So as I said, I will um, I will pause at various um, parts of the presentation uh, if there's any queries or, or questions. So hopefully that's um, reasonably straightforward and we'll um, we'll kick off. Um, so in terms of the, the consultation process on the draft plan, the consultation is um, uh, is now live. Uh, started on the 19th of April, will close on the uh, on the 12th of July. Um, we would encourage um, people to uh, to get involved in the uh, uh, in the consultation process. You can do that through the uh, consultation portal, um, which is on the gov.je website, and you can simply uh, follow the links. And submit your comments um, through that uh, through that process. In terms of the um, the timeline that we're working to, um, the consultation phase that we're now in um, is part of the um, statutory process for reviewing the plan. And um, any comments that are made during this period of consultation uh, will be collated at the end of the. Uh, consultation period considered by the Minister for the Environment, who will then publish an initial response to any comments that are made. Uh, all of that material will be considered by uh, planning inspectors um, who will hold a planning inquiry uh, examination in public later on this year. Uh, we're probably looking at um, October, November time for, um, for that to take place, um, where the planning inspectors will consider all of the the key issues that have been raised during this consultation phase uh, and then produce a, a report to the minister um, towards the end of this year, beginning of next year. I'd also add that this consultation phase is not just open to members of the public, it's also open to states members um, to raise any issues uh, and lodge amendments in relation to the draft plan. Uh, they will also be considered by planning inspectors um, through the EIP process. Um, and so they will be treated in the same way as uh, as representations, uh, but will obviously remain as um, potential amendments to the to the draft plan. Um, so once the planning inspectors have produced their report, uh, the minister will consider that um, that report uh, that report will also be published, and um, the minister will be able to lodge amendments in light of the inspectors' comments, as will other states members. So there'll be a window for amendments prior to the um, draft plan and any amendments to it being considered by the state's assembly and uh, that debate on the uh, on the draft plan will take place um, sometime in in march next year uh, so that's the um that's the timeline in terms of the consultation process on the draft plan uh, obviously we're holding a series of these thematic webinars. We held a couple last week. Some of you may have attended those um, and we've got those programmed out for the rest of the month of um, May and into early June. Uh, in addition to that, we are also starting this week the first of the parish uh, road shows where uh, there'll be actual real live events with people um, attending them. Um, so uh, if you want to come and talk to us in in the flesh please do so come uh, please come along to those those parish events starting in in St Helier tomorrow um, we're going to each of the island's parishes 
Um, the events, as you can see on the on the slide, are uh, generally starting um, in the uh, in the afternoon, running through to early evening during the week, uh, and then we've got some sessions also at the um, at the weekend. Um, so hopefully giving people opportunity to uh, come and talk to us. Uh, in addition to that, at the end of each week, we're also holding um, online planner surgeries. Um, so if there are issues um, that are raised during any of these webinar events, you can book a uh, book a slot um, with a, uh, a member of the Island Plan Review team to um, discuss any issues that you want to um, uh, consider in more detail. So um, hopefully um, plenty of opportunity for you to, to get involved and to uh, engage with us. Um, we will um, also likely be holding additional surgery events into, um, into June. Uh, once these um, thematic sessions are um, uh, are completed. Um, so that was what I was going to say about the consultation process. Don't know if anybody's got any queries or um, questions that they want to raise in relation to that. Uh, I can't see any hands. Can I? I heard somebody there. Was that Catherine? No. No, OK, um, well, if not, I'll um, I'll just move on to the next stage, which is uh, just to give a uh, quick overview of the of the draft plan. Um, as uh, with previous island plans, the, the plan itself is formed of two key elements. That's the actual written report itself, the written plan supported by uh, a series of, um, of maps. Um, because of the level of information that's um, now on the on the maps, we've we've got um, uh, we've got four maps now: uh, two at island-wide level and uh, two at um, uh, a town level or a, a, an insat map map level. Uh, so, firstly, the island plan um, proposals map showing all of the the planning zones, um, together with a, an island-wide map showing uh, flood risk data. And the same is repeated for the um, uh, for the inset map uh, covering most of uh, most of town. Same format for that. In terms of the structure of the plan, it's a little different to um, the current island plan. Uh, similar in some respects, in that it does have uh, a set of um, uh, strategic policies um, at the front of the plan in a strategic framework, which is then supported by. Uh, a series of thematic um, policies, uh, but there are some uh, specific differences. Um, there are a series of strategic proposals at the front of this plan, and they are um, uh, pieces of work that uh, will be addressed as a priority during the, um, the plan period. Um, and there's also a, a new section of the plan, uh, something um, that's featured in the strategic framework, and that's a, a new policy regime relating to places. So different parts of the island's uh, environment are identified there, and the uh, an overarching policy framework is provided, which gives a uh, an indication of the uh, extent, form, and scale of development for different parts of the um, different parts of the island. Similar format to the current plan. All of the policies in, set out in the in the plan have a, um, a preamble uh, where that policy is um, is justified, and more information about the operation of the policy is given, uh, and they're set out in the plan in a in a blue box, and proposals are identified in in green boxes, which uh, may identify the need for either preparation of additional supporting information or further work to be undertaken during the the bridging plan period. Um, so how does that work? Um, just is just a sort of visual representation of, of what I've just said. So um, uh, the strategic context set out at the, uh, the front end of the plan, together with those strategic policies and place related policies, uh, which are then supported by the thematic detail policies. Um, as with the current plan, uh, policies should not be read in isolation and um, the whole of the plan needs to be considered um, in relation to any specific proposals that are put forward, um, the relevant policies, uh, whether they sit at a strategic level or a detailed thematic level need to be taken into account. 
in preparing the plan, we've also um, sought to uh, refresh some elements of the evidence base that support the plan. Uh, some of those have been published in advance of the, um, the plan being published last month. Um, others were released uh, with the plan itself. Um, so just a, a, a list of those there so you can see the information that's um, being produced. All of that's available online and um, can be accessed through the um, dedicated island plan page. Uh, the only uh, uh, report due to be published and we are um, uh, expecting that imminently is the sustainability appraisals. So that's an independent review uh, of the sustainability of the, um, the plan uh, that's been undertaken and that will be published to uh, accompany the, um, the rest, of the, rest of the evidence base. Um, Clearly our, our focus today is around the historic environment, so we're going to touch a little bit on the strategic policy framework of the draft plan, um, also the um, some of the place policies that are of particular relevance to the historic environment uh, before we get into the, um, into the detail of the thematic policies. Um, so again, I'll just, just pause there in case anyone's got any queries or questions about the, the structure of the plan. No. OK, uh, well, we'll um, we'll move on to uh, some of the detail of the plan. So um, firstly, touching on the issue of the evidence base and the uh, strategic context. Um, there are two um, probably key pieces of evidence base that have been commissioned um, to support the plan that are of direct relevance to the historic environment section of the uh, or policies in the plan. Uh, the first of these was a um, a piece of work that we commissioned from uh, Arab, um, and it was a, it was a broader piece of work than just focused on island plan policy. So effectively, um, this piece of work sought to undertake uh, a review of the um, uh, effectiveness of the historic environment. Um, protection regime overall, so not just focused on policy, but also um, looking at issues uh, related to the legal framework that we operate in Jersey, um, together with um, with policy, um, plus also um, guidance and uh, just the general operation of the whole historic environment system. Um, uh, that was. Um, done in a way that sought to assess the robustness of um, our, our current approach in Jersey uh, in its own right, but also relative to how things operate elsewhere. So there was a, a comparative review undertaken as part of that, that piece of work. Um, the key findings uh, arising from that are, um, are set out here. So um, uh, you know, it was generally found that our, uh, our protection regime is um, uh, is reasonably robust and and competent, uh, but there were some recommendations made in relation to that. Um, in terms of the island plan, um, some recommendations were made around the the policy framework, and they've been um, reflected on in the preparation of the uh, of the draft plan and and the policies that are specific to the historic environment. A number of other elements were also picked up on, which will be progressed outside of the um, the island plan uh, framework. So, if you want to find more information about that, please do so, do go and look at that piece of evidence base. The other one that's of um, particular interest to the historic environment is the review of the St Helier Urban Character Appraisal, um, last undertaken in two thousand and five. And uh, we're fortunate um, to secure the services of um, Willie Miller Urban Design Team, uh, who undertook a review of the uh, the previous work that they uh, they carried out in St Helier. Um, and again, that's got particular resonance for the historic environment, given the concentration of um, listed buildings and places uh, in St Helier, uh, but also the focus of development activity in in town. Um, so some. Uh, specific findings have emerged in, in relation to that, which again have been uh, reflected upon in the preparation of the of the draft plan. Uh, and again, I'd urge you to uh, to look at that piece of work. In terms of the um, the policies, um, what we propose to do is just to give you a brief outline of the policies that are of particular relevance to the historic environment. Um, also to give you a bit of a shorthand note to indicate the extent to which any policies are 
are new or have been changed to any um, significant uh, degree. Uh, in all cases, all policies have been reviewed, um, so th there may be some uh, difference in emphasis or, or nuance in the in the policy, um, but um, uh, this is just a, a shorthand notation to um, uh, guide you through the uh, the process. Um, as you can see from this slide, um, the set of strategic policies in the plan is um, uh, all uh, uh, generally new, uh, either a change of emphasis in terms of the wording or, or completely new um, strategic policies. Uh, the ones that we will focus on in particular in relation to the historic environment are those related to um, uh, climate change, uh, the spatial strategy, um, placemaking and island identities. So uh, I'll just give you a quick overview of those. Um, in terms of responding to climate change, this, this plan, the draft plan, um, uh, makes a, an explicit response to that. The current plan is um, uh, does make reference to climate change, but not in any um, sort of explicit or co um, uh, sort of cohesive way. Um, the the new plan has a specific section related to to climate change, and that's framed by this uh, strategic policy. Uh, and the particular relevance of this to the historic environment is recognising that the um, uh, historic buildings uh, have some um, you know embodied energy, uh, some. Uh, carbon capture uh, within the existing fabric of historic buildings uh, and so there's a uh, a policy framework that sort supports the appropriate reuse and retention of um, existing buildings which is obviously uh, of relevance to the approach um, that is adopted in relation to historic buildings um, in terms of the spatial strategy um, again the draft plan sets out a um, uh, a spatial strategy around how we should um, deal with and focus uh, development activity over the uh, the short term plan period. Um, the shift, whilst this is similar to the current plan with a focus on the existing built up areas, uh, there is a, a there is an explicit shift in this plan in that um, the current island plan uh, generally um, uh, provides no explicit disaggregation between the the uh, treatment of different built up areas. Uh, this plan explicitly recognises that um, um, the different contexts of uh, different urban centres in particular across the island um, with St Helier remaining the primary focus for development activity, explicit recognition that Lekenove will play a secondary role uh, and then um, seeking to differentiate between the role of other uh, smaller centres. So we've got local centres which are um, generally those uh, that are comprised of the, the parish centres together with some of the um, uh, uh, suburbs of, um, of St Helier uh, and then some smaller settlements which are just those um, pockets of development that might be spread throughout the countryside that um, probably have very limited uh, services and facilities. Um, in terms of the um, uh, the issue of uh, placemaking, there's again there's explicit recognition in uh, this plan of the uh, policy emphasis around placemaking, and the relevance of that to the historic environment is obviously the contribution that the um, historic buildings and places make to our uh, uh, our sense of identity and the um, sense of place and local townscape or, or landscape. Um, so that's explicitly recognised at this strategic level um, in the plan. But the most directly relevant um, strategic policy for the historic environment is what we've called the um, uh, protecting and promoting island identity and that's really seeking to recognise the um, uh, the explicit contribution that um, Jersey's heritage makes to island identity, and uh, the role that the physical fabric of our um, our built, built form contributes to the to the character of the of the island and and people's um, sense of place. Uh, so again, that's explicitly recognised in this overarching um, strategic policy. I've mentioned that um, this plan introduces the specific um, place policies 
Um, and as I said earlier, these provide a uh, an overarching uh, view about how these places should perform and contribute to the island's development needs over the, the planned period. Um, probably the most relevant one, whilst, whilst um, you know, aspects of um, Jersey's heritage listed buildings and places exist throughout uh, the island. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is a particular uh, focus of um, uh, historic buildings in, in town and there is an explicit um, place policy for St Helier um, focused on what we call the, the town, uh, the, the town of St Helier, not, uh, that's not contiguous with the parish. It embraces those urban parts of St Helier, uh, but it also includes parts of St Clement and uh, St Saviour. The plan for town is set out in a um, uh, in the places section of the the plan, and provides this um, uh, overview of the uh, uh, through a series of eight concepts for um, St Helier uh, about how the uh, how the town might be um, developed over the the plan period, but giving explicit recognition to um, key elements of that and looking at how we might um, develop the town in a way that's um, sustainable and has regard to the um, not just the ability to absorb more development but also the impact of that development on um, in relation to the historic environment that the character of the uh, of the town um, it's a, uh, its sense of place and also the impact on those uh, on those key assets themselves um, Two key elements to bring forward. Two, two of the key concepts in there are firstly around the uh, protection of um, uh, the existing town character and the heritage assets. And the plan seeks to set out an approach whereby these are regarded as, um, uh, or should be regarded as um, assets for um, uh, reuse and um, uh, their potential to contribute to um, regeneration and um, include some examples of that which we can use to um, illustrate that point where they've uh, successfully delivered um, uh, in relation to enhancing the the character of the town protecting her heritage assets and contributing to to sense of place um, so again the the plan just highlights those policies that might pick up on this uh, on this concept and serve to um, help deliver that as a as a concept. The other issue is around the integration of um, new development in St Helier. As I said earlier on in the spatial strategy set out in the plan, there is a focus on town in terms of um, town serving to um, absorb and accommodate much of the island's development needs over the, the plan period. Um, clearly that has the potential to create uh, some tension with the um, uh, notion of uh, protecting um, heritage assets and town cape, townscape character. Um, but the plan seeks to do that in a way by recognising that um, different parts of the town have different um, capacity to um, accommodate um, different levels and different types of development. Um, particularly looking at issues associated with um, density and height. Uh, and again, this is where the evidence base um, provided by the work that um, Willie Miller's team um, is uh, is important in helping to uh, contribute to the uh, to the plan. Uh, and again, the plan sets out those elements of policy that might help to deliver that uh, that concept. Um, so that was a quick uh, run through some of those um, strategic elements. Again, I'll um, I'll pause in case there are any queries or or questions in relation to that. No. OK, uh, well, then I'll go through some of the uh, the more detailed policy as it relates to the um, historic environment. So in terms of the um, the range of policy considerations there, um, uh, similar to the the current plan, um, but perhaps a um, uh, a change of emphasis in in relation to uh, some of the policies, and uh, we'll touch on those as we we go through the detail. Um, so, firstly, the um, uh, policy HE1 
um, which seeks to uh, protect listed buildings and their settings. So explicit recognition of the um, uh, the need to ensure that um, setting is a material consideration um, that was introduced in the uh, in the current plan uh, and this plan seeks to um, uh, further strengthen that and to give greater policy consideration to that. Um, so uh, any proposals that affect listed buildings and places um, and their settings uh, is a material consideration. Uh, it must, uh, proposals must seek to protect the special interest and uh, should improve the significance of the, the asset. Um, and I suppose that's one of the um, key shifts around the, the policy regime here uh, in relation to the, um, the draft plan is, is um, giving explicit consideration to this um, consideration of the significance of the asset and the impact of development or potential impact development upon that um, significance. So there's a series of tests that are set out in the um, in the policy, um, which hopefully provide us with a, a more explicit framework against which um, proposals that affect the historic environment can be uh, tested and considered. And you can see on the slide there that those um, those explicit tests are set out in the um, in the policy regime. Um, in terms of um, proposals for reuse, we've already mentioned the um, the considerations of uh, climate emergency and reducing carbon emissions. Um, proposals for reuse of um, listed buildings will be um, supported in in principle uh, and then tested in terms of detail in terms of their uh, compatibility with the um, uh, reuse of historic assets and their uh, impact on the um, uh, protection of the long term um, sort of viability and the uh, protection of the particular interest of that um, of that asset um, and likewise setting must be part of that consideration. Uh, as with all um, issues affecting the historic environment it's uh, critical that we are provided with um, sufficient information as part of the um, planning application process uh, to us to demonstrate that the um, significance of the asset is is understood and has been um, considered as part of the development of the um, development proposal and uh, that its impact on on the um, on the asset on the special interest of the uh, of the asset can be taken into account uh, and that's a common theme throughout all of the historic environment policies as i said the um, uh, the preamble will provide additional information in relation to the um, policy and um, uh, this just simply seeks to reiterate and provide more information about um, what we mean when we talk about um, assessing the impact of change on listed buildings and places and understanding the significance of the asset. Uh, and we would expect applicants to make use of the existing sources of information that are available to them. So uh, that would include um, uh, investigation of the uh, basis of the listing of any um, uh, building or place. Um, clearly the information around that is published on the um, existing um, database um, provided through gov.je um, where listing schedules are available and we've also seen Jersey Heritage um, uh, their introduction of the um, uh, historic environment record which also provides um, a wider degree of information around um, uh, not just listed assets but also um, other parts of the um, island uh, heritage um, which might serve to have relevance to a, a particular um, development proposal or, or planning application. Um, so we would expect uh, applications to be supported by um, a full analysis of the um, historic interest of a, of a site and uh, a demonstration of um, how that's been taken into account in the preparation of um, development proposals uh, and that includes consideration of the, the setting of the asset as well. Um, 
Moving on to historic windows, the um, essential thrust of this policy uh, remains the same. Um, although there is um, a greater level of um, uh, transparency, if you like, around how proposals uh, affecting um, historic windows and doors in um, listed buildings and places or, or buildings in a conservation area when they, they come along uh, will be assessed. Um, so again, the, um, uh, the thrust is that um, where proposals affect a, uh, a window or door that's of significance, um, then repair of that um, uh, element of the uh, of the building um, is the uh, is, is where we would start. Um, the policy provides greater uh, recognition, however, that um, where repairs not feasible or where uh, windows or doors may be of little or no significance to the building. Um, then replacement um, may be supported and it sets out the um, the basis on which that approach should be um, uh, should be dealt with. The policy also has explicit recognition of um, uh, the replacement of windows or doors in modern extensions to um, historic buildings. You know, we recognise that buildings have changed over time and um, there may be more ad more modern elements that feature in those um, in those structures. So the policy um, endeavours to provide that um, um, more uh, explicit um, framework for how approaches to um, dealing with change that affects historic windows and doors might be considered. Um, much of this is set out in existing supplementary planning guidance and we've sought to absorb that um, that approach um, into the um, into the draft island plan policy um, so that there is this more explicit and clear framework to enable proposals of this sort to be uh, to be dealt with and uh, we've tried to represent that visually in terms of the um, approach that can be taken in developing a, a strategy about how you might deal with um, historic windows and doors um, in a listed building or place. Um, moving now into the issue of um, conservation areas, um, clearly we um, uh, we don't have um, conservation areas in the island um, as yet. Um, I've just moved on a couple of slides just really to highlight the fact that there uh, there is a proposal in the plan that talks about the um, the work that's required to bring conservation areas into effect in the island. Um, the first of those is about establishing an appropriate legal framework. So uh, the current planning and building law um, doesn't have any uh, explicit provision in relation to the provision of conservation areas. Uh, that's being addressed by the Minister as part of the amendment to the planning and building law. So uh, planning and building law amendment number eight is in train at the moment. Um, law drafters have been busy with um, dealing with COVID um, legislation. Uh, they're now turning their attention um, to the work that was um, lodged with them and um, the work to planning and building law number eight will be um, progressed um, during this year. Um, so that change to primary legislation is required to enable conservation areas to be brought into effect. Um, that will give us the ability to designate them. There'll need to be some secondary legislation that deals with the uh, processes and procedures of, of doing that in detail um, and also setting out an appeal mechanism. Um, so that will need to follow uh, the changes to, to primary legislation. In addition to that, we will also need to develop um, what we've called a, a policy framework. So that will set out the, the criteria for assessing conservation areas in the island, um, provide details about uh, what conservation area appraisals will, will be, what their scope will be, what they will look like. Um, and um, that will also set out um, processes for engaging with um, uh, landowners and parties affected by any proposals for for designation uh, and then the third element of that is is the the sort of basic survey work that's required to uh, identify and assess those parts of the island that um, 
may come forward as um, conservation areas. Uh, the minister's given an indication that um, uh, St Obin is likely to be the, um, uh, the first candidate. Um, for conservation area designation in the island. So that was just a bit of the, the background, some of the procedural things. Um, in terms of the uh, policy regime that will apply to conservation areas, uh, once they're designated, the draft plan seeks to uh, set that out. And um, uh, essentially the key thrust is that development proposals should protect or improve the character or appearance of, of conservation areas and their settings. Again, a series of tests against which um, any proposals that might harm um, character or appearance might be uh, might be assessed. And uh, again, the notion that reuse of um, buildings within conservation areas um, will be supported um, where they make a positive contribution to, to character and appearance. In terms of demolition, there's a specific policy provision in the plan for how we might deal with demolition in conservation areas. And uh, essentially the, the key issue here is about demonstrating that um, uh, there's no um, practical possibility of um, uh, reusing the building. And, um, but also a re explicit recognition that there might be instances where the removal of a building or structure within a conservation area may actually um, give potential to make a positive contribution to um, its existing character or appearance. So clearly this recognises that conservation areas um, won't just be limited um, to listed buildings and places, they will embrace other structures that um, of themselves may not have um, much heritage value or may contribute little to townscape um, character or appearance and there may be potential to enhance that through um, development processes. Um, the uh, Any consent for demolition in conservation areas however would be subject to um, uh, probably planning obligation agreements seeking to ensure that um, any uh, demolition works were uh, subject to contracts being in place for um, either redevelopment or um, or landscaping of um, uh, of sites within conservation areas to avoid the scenario where we're left with um, uh, gap sites um, as a result of uh, of demolition works being undertaken. Um, one other proposal that sits in the, the plan, and again, this, this came out of the work um, that was undertaken to review the um, historic environment protection regime, is just to review our permitted development rights um, to ensure that they are appropriate um, relative to the uh, level of regulatory control that we would have um, within conservation areas once they're introduced. Um, so that's another piece of work that will need to be undertaken to ensure that we've got the appropriate level of um, control within conservation areas once they're designated. Um, the last area is around um, uh, archaeological heritage. Um, so again, a, a similar uh, thrust to the current policy regime in the current plan. Um, so uh, essentially the policy approach here is that development should seek to uh, conserve archaeological heritage in situ um, where that's um, where that's possible so that's the the principle that's that's supplied um, again there's a series of tests um, that enable that to be assessed where um, uh, for whatever reason uh, where that's justified uh, it's not possible to preserve uh, archaeological heritage in situ um, so that's set out in the in the policy uh, where that's not the case um, there's a requirement to um, undertake appropriate archaeological evaluation and recording and that's um, something that the developer would be required to um, undertake and fund as part of any uh, development proposal that would harm um, archaeological heritage. Um, so that was essentially the key elements of, um, of policy. Uh, so I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to stop there and invite any uh, questions that um, anyone 
may have. So if you'd like to ask any queries, please just uh, raise your hand. I can see uh, I can see John Baker. Um, John, do you want to uh, to go first? Yeah, OK. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, right. Well, sort of uh, the basis of my question is how with this new initiative well, we're worldwide about um, the climate emergency, carbon neutrality, eco buildings, um, you know, so that movement balances against our um, quite justified um, benefits of keeping the uh, historic Victorian maritime town. Um, I mean, obviously, you can't you can't treat the town as a museum. You can't say, well, you can't you, you can't touch it. We've got to preserve it forever. You've got to, you've got to. There's got to be a balance. And you've mentioned windows and doors, but I mean, for instance, um, one of the things we mentioned at the recent housing webinars is, is, is the need for more housing and the possibility of allowing people to extend their properties. So if you've got a if you've got a um, a historic building in, in the town centre and but then there was room for extension. Would you insist that that extension be a historic match? Um, I mean, I've, I've seen, for instance, where um, places such as um, churches have added uh, extensions, but have, have joined them with plate glass corridors, this sort of thing. So would you would you be keen to see modern extensions or more historic blended extensions in traditional materials? And if so, balance that against the fact that certainly in the UK one can um, one can get local grants from for instance from historic England in order to preserve and maintain um, some of these historic properties now I, I'm, I'm not up to date whether grants are available but maybe that's something we need to bear in mind particularly as you know if you are going to uh, insist on listing buildings and, and putting constraints on that could affect the value of them and that should be balanced, balanced, I think, by the public, um, uh, the public initiative and, and value of um, making a contribution to allow these buildings to be maintained. So, how do you balance this 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 requirement, and how firm is the requirement to to keep the fine detail of the historic match? Uh, okay, well, uh, quite a lot in that uh, question. So um, perhaps I'll deal with the issues of principle, and uh, and I might invite. Uh, uh, my colleague Tracy Ingle to deal with some of the issues of, uh, of detail. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think perhaps the first thing to say is, um, you know, clearly the uh, the basis of the um, uh, the island seeking to identify and um, protect its historic environment is based on the uh, the fact that the uh, well a number of uh, issues, but. Um, uh, firstly, the um, you know the island's got obligations uh, under international conventions to do that. Obviously, this is uh, uh, the heritage is uh, is of Jersey, but it's reflective of a uh, 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 you know a wider global heritage of which the, the heritage in Jersey makes a, a contribution. And so, uh, it's important that um, we identify and protect those those heritage assets that make a contribution to that. Um, uh, global global heritage, uh, so and there's a statutory requirement to, to do that. So uh, I think it's important to uh, to recognise that. Um, and in terms of how we manage change to those historic assets, I mean clearly they are uh, identified, uh, assessed, and designated in the uh, in the first place based on the fact that they've got some special interest that's of um, of public value. It's of public importance, not just to um, uh, to islanders, but as as I mentioned earlier, to uh, uh, you know this whole notion of a, a contribution to, to global heritage, European or global heritage. Um, so, um, you know, the, the the fact that we identify and protect heritage heritage assets is something that um, uh, is of uh, uh, is is deemed to be of public good, and the um, you know clearly the. Uh, the island um, has uh, brought in legislation and processes to enable us to um, enable us to do that. Um, now, clearly, uh, it, it's recognised and accepted accepted that um, historic buildings change um, over time, and that um, you know the planning system is there to to regulate and manage that that change. And um, it's always a balance between seeking to ensure that um, uh, historic buildings can be kept in a um, 
in a viable use, the best way to ensure that your heritage um, has a long-term sustainable future is to make sure it, it can be used and it can be used in a way that can protect its special interest, uh, sustain its character, uh, but ensure that it, um, uh, you know, it can be used in a way that's, that's relevant to today. Um, this tension in terms of the um, impact of um, uh, things like, um, you know, thermal performance and making sure historic buildings um, uh, operate as efficiently and effectively as possible, um, having regard to the, the sort of current um, standards that apply. Uh, there's already recognition within existing bylaws for building bylaws, for example, that, um, you know, there needs to, those sorts of issues need to be considered on a case by case basis. Um, and the, the uh, there's a balance to be struck between recognizing that um, listed buildings are designated because they have a particular special interest and then seeking to ensure that they can um, you know meet as far as possible uh, modern day requirements whether that be around um, things like access disabled access or whether it's around um, thermal performance so uh, it, it's always a balance in relation to um, those those objectives and a particular challenge in um, in the historic environment uh, I, know, I know people get um, very focused on this um, particularly around issues related to windows and doors but um, uh, you know the the number of historic buildings that we have is a small proportion of all of the buildings in the island and um, uh, you know the the attention that's given to that issue ought to be uh, proportionate in in that respect uh, in terms of the issues of grants, uh, we have had a grant scheme previously where um, it was recognised that um, if buildings and places in the island are um, designated because of their public interest and, the, and that then imposes some um, additional requirements on um, landowners, um, that, they, uh, that that ought to be supported in some way through some um, public uh, recognition of that. Uh, uh, as I say, we did have a grant scheme. It was um, uh, a relatively small amount of money, um, but uh, that was um, uh, operated several years ago. We had to uh, suspend that grant scheme to enable us to undertake the island-wide resurvey of all of the heritage assets, um, but um, that resource has not been um, re-established to enable us to um, uh, re-establish a grant scheme but the um, you know the, the the point is noted um, uh, whether there's a resource available in the future to re-establish that um, is obviously a, a political uh, political decision but the um, you know the point is the point is acknowledged um, perhaps if I can invite Tracy to um, to join the conversation to comment um, specifically on the um, the issue of how you deal with um, extension to uh, historic buildings and um, uh, whether she might want to comment on any of the other points that you've you've raised John uh, thanks Kevin thank thank you John okay. I suppose can you hear me yeah yeah thank you Very good I think one of the things the uh, new policy does is it sets out how we start to think about these things. And the most important part of it is understanding the building to start with. And one of the, the positives about the job I do in Jersey is when I can go out and meet people who own listed buildings and understand what they're trying to achieve and then balance that against what the building can accommodate in terms of change and how we can work together to come up with a proposal that will allow them to live in the building that they wish to live in for the time they are there. And I suppose one of the big things is always that issue of custodianship, that most people own a listed building for an amount of time, even if it's four or five generations, and that the art of what we're trying to do is to hand that building on to future generations in a form that is readily identifiable as a, a building from whichever century it comes from. I think the other part of that is to understand how we deal with climate change and embodied energy. And that is to suggest that listed buildings and older buildings behave in different ways. So sometimes you can do more harm than good trying to upgrade a listed building in a generic manner. So for me, it comes down to understanding why a building's listed, what its significance is, to understand what the current owners want to achieve and then work towards a solution. 
So there is no simple, it's all got to match or no, it all has to be contemporary. You will have seen extensions throughout the island that respond on both counts, both contemporary and modern. So I think um, I'm aware other people have questions. So I think I'll hand back to Kevin to pick up. I think Anthony had his hand up next. Yeah, sorry, I just one follow up question, a niggle uh, of mine. Um, around the town, um, yes. I've seen far too many Victorian terraces where somebody's knocked down the garden wall for a parking space. Could we please put a stop to that? I mean, that really is, it's bad for the environment because you're turning a garden into a concrete patch. And, you know, once you establish that that precedent, other people will eat, apply, and then we end up with all these beautiful Victorian uh, front gardens turned into parking spaces. What, what's your opinion on that? No, I, I, I take your point and I understand that. And I think that's where we have some strength when conservation areas are designated. There is also a requirement in many cases to, that controls the demolition of garden walls. But there is huge pressure for people to park on their curtilage, which is which is damaging. And um, we need to look no further than Green Street, where you can spot the listed buildings where the walls are in place and the unlisted buildings where the walls in some cases are allowed to go. So I take your point, John, and I will give it my best shot to work with you to keep as many of those characterful walls, especially now our 19th century elements of town, intact into the future. Brilliant. Thank you for your questions. I'll let, uh, I'll let somebody else have a go. Thank you. I think, uh, I think Anthony was, um, uh, was next. Hello, um, I, I have a question about public benefit. Um, HE1 says that uh, significance has to be retained. Uh, and then there's a final thing. It says wh where public benefit outweighs harm. Who determines public benefit and how is it determined? Uh, well, that's obviously uh, that vests with the uh, decision maker in terms of weighing up the um, you know, the uh, proposal uh, in terms of the benefit that the proposal might bring, bring relative to an assessment of the uh, 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 the impact of that proposal on um, on, e, on any um, listed building or place. So, um, uh, you know, and that, that's not dissimilar to the, um, the process that, that operates currently. Um, what we've tried to do in the policy is to provide a, a more explicit framework against which that um, that test can be um, evaluated and and judged. Yes, that 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 doesn't quite answer the question. I mean, it's a good good analysis of it, but it's really the mechanism by which public benefit is. I know it rests with somebody, <clears throat> but what I, what I was interested in is how is that determined because. This is exactly the area that there have been problems with, for instance, viability exercises and how viability is actually carried out, which is uh, not public. Uh, no, and I think, um, you know, as I said earlier on, the the issue that is um, uh, often uh, missing as part of the uh, assessment of development proposals can be the level of information that's provided to support any um, decision making process and that information might be related to uh, an understanding of the um, the heritage asset itself and the impact of development on that heritage asset but i think you also um, you know uh, usefully identify the issue of, of viability which is uh, something which is being increasingly um, brought into play um, particularly where development proposals uh, might affect listed buildings and an argument is made that it's that it's not viable to um, uh, uh, retain and incorporate those heritage assets into the uh, development scheme. Uh, we would argue that that viability information ought to be um, part of the planning application process and uh, be subjected to uh, independent review and analysis and uh, that, that then ought to be um, uh, material to the um, to the decision making process and we will seek to work with our our colleagues in the development control process to ensure that tests of viability are uh, brought into the um, decision making process so that those issues can be openly um, considered. But is that, is that going to be an island plan issue or is it a legal issue? Um, I, I don't think it's a um, I don't think it's a policy issue. I think it's a procedural issue. Um, it's about the information that's required to support a um, a planning application. Um, so it's uh, it, it's not of itself a um, uh, a policy issue. 
All right. So no, no. Yeah. All right. So that you just need to work with DC to 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 bring some light onto that. Yes, I think that's right. I think that's what's required is um, uh, some guidance as to what would be expected of a viability appraisal, what information ought to be um, provided, and then some detail around the process that that would uh, that that would go to go through. Thank you. And just related to that is an issue to do with conservation areas where. There's a phrase not practical to repair or reuse uh, in terms of demolition. And again, it is who decides. Um, I mean, there's a problem in Jersey with lack of care registered engineers, for, for example, who don't have the skill set to be able to, to repair something necessarily. Um, and what detail will be required in terms of that viability about what is considered not practical? Um. Yeah, I might uh, ask my colleague Tracy to um, deal with that issue of detail, which is probably more uh, qualified to comment on than than I am. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, in terms of conservation areas, I think it needs to follow a similar um, path in as much as if there is a suggestion that it is impractical, that practicality would need to be openly tested as part of any planning application. And then it would need to be balanced against all of the other island plan issues that come forward. Um, my experience has been that you do need to understand how to repair historic buildings to come up with a practical repair solution. And I suspect one of the challenges in Jersey is our um, registration scheme for structural engineers where professional indemnity might cause a, a very cautious approach or one that um, responds to modern standards without considering carefully the, the impact on historic environment. So I accept there are some challenges there, but I think one of those areas is to develop um, a clearer understanding as we start to build up a, a case history of these types of approaches and work closely with the, um, the, the structural engineers that we have on the island uh, to think quite carefully about what listed buildings can and can't do. Thank you. I, I can see, uh, I think Paul, uh, Paul Harding had his hand up next. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yep. Yeah, um, I'm pleased to note the recognition uh, that uh, retrofitting double glazing to uh, historic windows can bring in terms of energy efficiency where it's appropriate and the glass is not uh, originally historic. Um, but there is no mention of retrofitting um, weather stripping to traditional sash windows for which there are uh, proven uh, systems available, um, which is probably more important in terms of energy efficiency in stopping those uh, old leaky sash windows from uh, leaking air. Again, I shall uh, hand on to my colleague. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, Paul. Yeah. Um, what, one of the things that I work with uh, owners of listed buildings to do is to think about their particularly sliding sash windows as, as mechanical um, and as mechanical things that need uh, care and attention. And so in the same way as if you don't put oil in your car, it stops working. If you don't oil or, or lubricate and look after your uh, sliding sash windows, they do much the same thing. Um, so in general terms, what I tend to do is see the retrofitting of draft stripping to the meeting rails, for example, and the parting beads in historic windows as, as more as part of overhaul and repair, unless that would require a major rebate or intervention into the historic joinery. So in terms of the policy context, there is at least a clarity as to when these things can happen. And if it's happening as part of a, a wider range of works, then that would be covered within a planning application. But in general terms, as you know, if you've got a, a damaged sill, then that can be a, a repair. Whereas if you start to replace the box frame, that needs a planning application. So one of the difficulties with historic windows is that we have we are fortunate to have such a wide variety of different types and styles. A policy like this can only set out a framework. The supplementary planning guidance also then takes that into a bit more detail. And then at the end of the day, it's conversations are between your clients, you and I, all on a day by day basis that allows us to make the best decisions we can for historic windows and doors. Thanks, Tracy. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. I can see uh, my colleague Natasha has her hand up. 
Hello. Hello. I tried to catch you uh, when Anthony was talking actually about uh, viability. Um, and I just thought I would kind of chip in and add that, um, yes, I, you know, we do have um, a lot of challenges in, in assessing uh, viability in a consistent and transparent way um, in Jersey. But there's some useful guidance um, produced by the uh, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, the RICS guidance, um, to uh, in particular. Uh, one is called Assessing Financial Viability and the other one is called Financial Viability in Planning, Conduct and Reporting. Um, the first one reports, um, uh, it, it aligns with the National Planning Policy Framework of the UK, which is obviously different uh, to our policy framework in Jersey, but there are lots of um, similarities. So whilst we don't have that guidance produced um, as yet in Jersey, we have actually mentioned um, elsewhere in the island plan, in the draft bridging island plan, and um, particularly under the managing emissions chapter, that we would look to that guidance as industry best practice um, to consider uh, viability in uh, planning applications. Okay, thanks for uh, thanks for that, Natasha. Um, any other questions? I can't see any um, can't see any hands raised. Um, if there aren't any more questions, the the last thing that we wanted to cover today was just really to provide a bit more information about how to engage with the process, appreciating that. Um, you know, people will be uh, just coming to grips with the, um, uh, the the plan itself and some of the evidence base. So, you know, as I said at the outset, um, you can find out more about different parts of the um, parts of the plan um, by uh, coming to any of these um, uh, future themed webinars. Which, uh, as I uh, mentioned at the outset, we've got a series of these running throughout um, throughout May into early June. Uh, the parish sessions start uh, start this week, and um, uh, you obviously can access the uh, the detail online. Um, after the event today, we'll be sending out a, a link to um, the planner surgery uh, booking. So if you want to uh, book a slot with um, any members of the Island Plan Review team, uh, you you can do that. Um, um, by booking that through the um, through the link that we will uh, say send out after the event, um, or you can uh, simply seek to um, you know lodge a uh, lodge a comment through the the consultation portal. Um, so those are the the opportunities to uh, engage with us. Um, uh, that was um, uh, the really the the end of the content today I can just see a couple of uh, questions outlined in the um, in the chat um, they've just come in Kevin so okay so um, the first one uh, I think Robin had his hand up so he wanted to ask a question directly or go through chat that's fine and I think John had a follow-up okay uh, did I see the question in the chat was around St Obin why that was identified as the first conservation area that's correct yes yeah um I think um uh, there's been um well it's a long-standing proposal that we bring forward conservation areas into the island and I think um St Obin had always been identified as one of the um, first areas that might uh, emerge as um, uh, an area that might be considered uh, but that's not to say that uh, other parts of the island um, wouldn't benefit from uh, conservation area status. So um, I think other candidates, uh, potential candidates, have included places like um, uh, Goree, um, uh, some places in, in town, for example. Now, whether we go for a single conservation area in town or we go for a series of smaller conservation areas, but there's clearly areas of um, distinct architectural character in St Helia, such as um, Half the Power and Cheapside or the um, uh, medieval core of the of the town, so that there's perhaps some more obvious candidates that might emerge. Um, also, some of the parish centres where you've got um, a uh, collection of, of uh, public buildings or um, uh, such as you know think a place like St Lawrence with the, the church and the uh, uh, the parish hall and the um, uh, the arsenal uh, with a collection of um, spaces in between them and some um, uh, characterful buildings that form the uh, form the settlement um, maybe some larger larger farm groups um, where there's been a series of um, small hamlets developed um, 
around uh, a collection of farm groups. So um, and again, some of the uh, maybe some of the smaller bays um, and harbours. So I think there's a range of um, opportunities and areas that might be embraced by conservation area designation, and that will be influenced by the um, the criteria that we uh, use to bring forward. Um, the development of those criteria would be subject to to public consultation. So, um, you know, in terms of bringing forward that policy framework for the designation of conservation areas, we would look to engage as part of that. And, and clearly in terms of identifying and designate specific conservation areas, uh, again, there would be a process of um, public engagement and uh, consultation around that as well. Um, so hopefully that, that provides some information in relation to that to that question. Uh, and then John has asked who will be doing the one to one on this topic, please. Uh, uh, I'm doing that on Friday, John. So uh, if you uh, uh, if you want to talk to me, then uh, please book a slot on on Friday. Um, uh, the other thing I would add is if there are other members of the team that you want to talk to about specific specific issues, uh, then please um, use the island plan at gov.je email as well. Um, uh, and you can post uh, post questions there and um, uh, we'll look to um, pick those up and uh, and come back to you. OK, well, if there are, if there are no further questions, um, thanks very much for your uh, attendance at the event today. Um, we'll be um, uh, publishing this online once the um, the recording is loaded. And uh, as I say, there are other opportunities to engage with us. So um, thanks very much and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you shortly. Thank you.